Hello listeners and welcome to the show. This is Sam Abrika, the CEO of Nova Money, an AI financial planner designed to help you build financial freedom. Each generation has its own financial challenges. Graham Brown is a Gen X, and at the time, he felt like he was crude because he couldn't make money in the stock market the way his parents could. So he made money in real estate instead, and it worked out for him. Today, Graham is going to share his story and his view on the challenges that millennials face. Hello, Graham, and welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. Wonderful to be here. Exciting. So, Graham, you're an entrepreneur, and we're going to talk about your entrepreneurial journey and how it also affected your perception of making money and mm. what to do with money. So maybe let's start with the beginning. How did you start your first company? First company? Well, mm. many years ago, Sam, I started a web design business in 1997, 98, when you could sell web designs. I had no clue, no idea, no experience in business, but I wanted to start my own business. So I started one with a friend, first mistake, starting a business with a friend. And all I wanted to do was start my own business and grow it and make lots of money. And I didn't achieve any of that. It was a disaster. <laughs> it lasted about a year and I ended up running up debt. So that was my first experience. Luckily, I learned a few things. Maybe that was a cheap MBA. How come? Because at the time, I remember I started to develop websites in the 20s and other time the web design was so horrible so i yeah. would have thought that as a web designer you would have lots of clients lots of big projects you would think right but mm -hmm. back then i remember you could sell you could go to a client and you could sell their brochure you'd scan their brochure so you'd get a scanner so a scanner in 1998 is cutting edge technology you could buy a scanner get the client's brochure, scan the brochure, and upload it to the website, just as JPEG files. <laughs> Seriously. And such to the, such an extent that even some people called it brochureware. You want brochureware? I can sell you brochureware. And they would sell this for, you know, like a, a few thousand euros or dollars, right? Or pounds. It was easy business. Were you more... A designer or a web developer? Everything. I was in you know, my background is coding and I studied artificial intelligence at university. So I, I liked coding, but I knew enough of the other side as well. I was not amazing at coding and not amazing at sales. I was in the middle. Hmm. So I was the guy that knew how to build something and knew how to sell it. So I thought that was a good area to be in. I didn't know how to do like really deep back end development. But at the same time. I don't think time, it was necessary at the time. Most websites, they were very primitive. They were primitive, but they were very hard to host them. You had to do FTP. FTP. Yes. Everything. Back in the days. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> <laughs> that was crazy. And then I think I remember Macromedia was a big name back then. You remember those guys? <laughs> Macromedia this Dreamweaver. horrible framework. So yeah. heavy. You remember Dreamweaver? Yeah. yeah, I wasn't using that. It was a big thing back then. So basically it would, um, I think the way it worked, I seem to remember, is that it would effectively upload all the files as you were writing them. And it'd give you like a framework to work in. It was very primitive. Mm -hmm. But at the time, it would, there was a lot of hand coding. So you needed to know HTML. You would even, some people would write websites in notepad right and or in I've microsoft word i know people who were coding <laughs> website on microsoft word in the front page in the very early days of the internet yeah we got by we managed i was actually uh, learning how I come think... you went into debt for your business because i would have thought it's a service business or so you would get paid by the project yeah which but is I had usually, an office. usually low risk yeah office that's the problem, what we were talking about earlier. 
because Fixed I cost. didn't have any, I didn't have any experience. So I thought to run a business, you need an office, you need to, <laughs> right? You need to hire somebody. So that was my mistake, right? I had no clue. So you close your first business after one year, mm. you had some debt because of fixed costs and offices. How did you rebound? So I was, whilst I was developing websites, I noticed, so basically I noticed that there was this growing interest in wireless application protocol, which is WAP at the time. And we're talking 9.6K websites on phones. And I started getting into this area and I found that I could actually develop WAP websites for the old phones in 98, 99. And as a result of that, I started extending my network in wireless. We're not talking telecoms back then, right? We're talking wireless development. And uh, we set up a second business, which was basically events around wireless, telecoms, mobile, mobile programming and that lasted about two years and it made good money and then it failed because everything was reliant on the bubble everything was reliant on sponsorship for events so we made money selling event sponsorship to mobile companies and developers who raised a lot of money in 2000 and in those days you didn't have these lean startups. People launched a business and the, they raised massive sums. And they then disappeared to build something for like two years and never came back into the light of the day again. You know, Pets Park, these kind of companies were out there. So they had a lot of money. And part of that is they wanted to get their CEO on events and we were providing the events for them. So it was a it was a second business. It was successful, but it didn't last. It was too reliant on the model of the internet bubble. The bubble, yeah. And in two thousand, late two thousand, it died. All the sponsorship money died out. And our business I was went too down. early to be entrepreneur at those days. But when I speak to older entrepreneurs, they told me that back in the time, you could just write any random bullshit business plan. You just put internet in the title. Yeah. And you would raise tons of money and nobody would ever ask, what are you doing? What's your business model? What's your product? It was very similar to the ICO, that ICO wave we had around 2017, 18 in the blockchain crypto space. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It was a very different world, but very similar in many ways. Yeah. Different world, but <laughs> similar yeah. process. It's, it's ICO, free capital, right? It's when there's like loose capital, hot money, you know, it flowed into internet stocks and then it flowed into telecom stocks as a safe harbor and then from 2001 it flowed into real estate it was a lot of loose money in the market for 10 years so i guess you were hit quite badly by the bubble burst of the internet hmm. back in the days a lot of people thought the internet is over it's not going to happen well obviously now we know that it was just the, the beginning of the trend. Maybe there is a parallel with blockchain and cryptocurrencies. That Maybe. The future will tell. Yeah. You want to ask Clement that. He will know the answer. Yeah, we'll ask Clement. <laughs> what was next for you? Well, so before I came back to the UK, I was living in Japan. And I was, I came to Japan in the mid 90s, teaching English. And one thing I saw in Japan was young people using mobile phones. And I was fascinated by it. I saw the future, but I didn't have an opportunity to build a business around it. I saw the future of telecoms, but I went into website design. Then I went into event sponsorship and it got me closer and closer and closer to where I wanted to go, which was talking about young people and mobile phones. That's what I wanted to do. And there was no opportunity. I didn't know how to turn that into a business. And what I found was that actually I could sell that information to a lot of the companies I'd been working with and telecoms companies. And so we started writing reports. We started, some of us from the second business started the third business, which was a telecoms research company focusing on young people and mobile phones. And we were the only company in the world talking about it writing research 
and it was a very successful business. We made a lot of money selling to all kinds of telecoms companies, um, brands, media companies. We sold to Disney, MTV. Every single mobile operator in the world bought our research. Every single handset manufacturer bought our research. And it was a really, really good business model because you write one report and then you sell it for 12 months. And then next year, the update. So it was a great model, but it, you know, every business has a life cycle. So that business lasted 12 years, but it was a good run. And it taught me many lessons. 12 years, pretty good. Hmm. What but do you, you think made you successful? Sorry, go ahead. What do you think made you successful in that business? Um, I had, because you had identified the problem that yeah. companies had, or did they know they had this problem? I think identifying a problem is one thing. That's what all entrepreneurs are good at, finding a problem. The next part is actually the mechanics of the business. And for example, website design is a real problem. People want websites. So here's the solution, design. Reports, the problem is people want to know about this market. The solution is the reports. Now, the key here is the structure of the business. You know, you can sell a report for $10,000, right? But it's difficult to sell a website for that. And a website requires a lot of work and is an agency model. So the difference between the two models was one was software, write once, sell a thousand times. And the other one was agency, which was you sell and then you do the work. So the key difference was The problem identification was probably the same, same level. And maybe the markets were the same size, but the main difference was the model. And that's why I think it's so important to get the model right. Because agencies only ever fund the next month. That's how they're set up. But if you can get leverage, you know, you can grow a big business. That's the difference between a tech company and an agency. Mm. In a, an agency would take work, they would get paid usually for that work and they know what they have to deliver because the client is giving them a project. However, if you want to scale your revenue, then you need, if you want to 10x your revenue, you need to 10x your amount of employees and resources. There's a one-to-one -one ratio between your mm. revenues and the human resources. In tech company, well, it's the opposite. In the beginning, you struggle because you don't have a product. You need to understand the problems, bring a solution. But then once you find it, once you find like a good solution to a hot problem that companies are willing to pay for it, then it just scales. Mm. You have your software, you can sell $10,000 for one report and sell it to X amount of telecom companies across the world. Yeah. The problem with the software model though is you have to get the problem It's high risk. Yeah, it is totally high risk. That's why people raise funds and money on it because it requires, there's a lot of competition as well. With the agency model, you can just get started and you can keep iterating, iterating. I know you can do that with software, but it's different in the sense that, you know, you have to know exactly the problem you're solving to build around it. It's hard to change software. So that's the challenge. You know, you need to, have both maybe that hybrid many software companies came from agency you know they started out consulting a good example is hubspot you know they started consulting and then they turn it into software it's a difficult transition to make but if you can make that you've really identified the problem and then you scale it yeah i guess because when you're doing the consulting you're talking to customers on mm. a daily basis You're the first person to see all the problems that they have. And often it can be automated with software and that creates the business case. But as you said, mm. HubSpot, I'm sure there are other examples, but they kind of sound like the exceptions because the mindset and the idea behind creating an agency company and a tech company, it's almost completely different. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Like the route, one is... A relatively low risk, you bring client, they will bring the project. 
and you will get paid for the next month or for the next three months for the duration of the project. The other is two guys in a garage. That's a cliche, but it's not that far from reality. Mm. And you try to iterate on like hacking a first solution, the first version of the product, trying to set it before it's completely ready. And then you hope to knock at the door of venture capitalists that they will fund your, your company to be like the good product and then get the revenues rolling. Mm. Yeah, the second model will work in that context, as long as there is capital to support it, you know, that we haven't fully seen the cycle of investments that people have made such that the fund limited partners can say, actually, that was a good investment. Those seven years, those five years I've been invested in this fund. We need to happen that, that at a macro level where people say, actually, um, maybe this is not a good idea investing in startups, or maybe this is a great idea. Let's do more of it. We don't yet know. We don't have enough experience and timeline and case studies to challenge the model. So currently people are doing that and they're funding and that's great. And long may that continue. But if these limited partners decide that actually I can get a better return investing in real estate or investing in shopping malls, or rice farms, whatever it may be, then, you know, that, all that model in startups will start to dry up. The startup investing is kind of special because it's kind of like cryptocurrencies, high risk, high reward. Mm. And typically what venture capitalists do, they are the ones specialized in startup investment. They know that out of 10 companies, there will be one that will drive 90% of the profit Half of them will die, and that's fine. It's part of the game because the one that will succeed will make so much profit that the whole strategy and the whole portfolio is profitable. And then there are about three, four in the middle who are profitable, who are successes, but they wouldn't be like massive billion-dollar company. So startup investing is... I don't want to say it's a number game because it would give the impression that you just need to invest in a lot of startups, but... Let's say it's distribution game. You need mm. always to keep in mind that you will have 10 companies. Out of 10 companies, one will do well. And the others, the winners will pay for the losers. Yeah. Everybody wants a drop box, don't they, in their portfolio? Yes. That will make it all worthwhile. But theoretically, when you do startup investment, you would expect much higher return than real estate, commercial, etc. Yeah, yeah. You would expect to have like, 1,000x return. Well, real estate is, is a bad investment right now. <laughs> like, you know, commercial real estate, forget it. So Yeah, yes. have you tried? Not commercial. I've been, yeah, I mean, I've looked at commercial real estate back, you know, many years ago when we had an option to buy our office and then rent it back to the company. Um, that was a, a real consideration and it probably would have been a good deal but it's quite high risk. There's a lot more in commercial real estate than private, you know, retail real estate. You know, so it's a lot more high risk. You need to know what you're doing. What did you do with all the revenues and the profit you made from this third business? Hmm. So, yeah, I had a very good advice. Like I had a, a mental figure who said to me that you can sell the business. But back then, you know, we're talking 2000. People didn't sell businesses. You weren't acquired. It didn't happen. You went IPO. <laughs> that was it. Or you got really lucky. There wasn't this, all this market of big companies acquiring small ones. Not a lot, not to my knowledge. Mm. You know, like you didn't really have that kind of SaaS business out there. You, you, you didn't have a lot of, again, a lot of innovation was in-house. So, you know, if you were an Oracle or an IBM and you wanted to buy a data company, you probably would have done it in-house 20 years ago, right? Today, it's cheaper to buy yeah. a company, right? So all the banks, they had their own, you know, their skunk works who were doing the innovation and telecoms companies are the same. So the chances of selling were quite low. So somebody advised me, take the cash flow out of the business and stick it in real estate. And that was a good move. In my timing and the important part is 20 years ago that made sense 20 years ago that the real estate market was buoyant bullish 
for the best part of up until about 2006, 2007. So that was important. Like today it would be a different decision because it would be different asset class. But back then, 20 years, it was a good time to invest in real estate in London. So that's what I did. And that was probably the best financial decision I made over time. Of course, it hurt at the time. It hurt the business and it hurt me personally, financially. But in time... What kind of sacrifice did you have to make to your business and to yourself to invest in real estate? Yeah, we were we were just taking every last dollar out of the company. Oh, me really? Business. Yeah, I mean, obviously... No reinvestment? No. Zero? No. Zero. Yeah, we took everything out. Just enough to run the company. Because it was an agency based, we were selling reports, right? But, and that's a software model, but there's only, it still requires human beings to do it. Hmm. And a lot of it was based around a few individuals, sales, writing the reports. It was difficult to get leverage, therefore it's difficult to invest in growth. Um, very difficult back then to create an app like we do now. You could create a mobile app, but it's very different. So yeah, very, 20 years ago, the ecosystem was so different. There were no opportunities to, maybe I didn't see them. But it was like the kind of things that people would invest in is buying distribution. So they would buy a small app developer and like one app developer would buy another app developer with a pretty, you know, not very good deal. You know, they're not talking like massive multiples. They're effectively just making sure that the other guy gets their salary plus a few shares. So there wasn't really a lot going on back then. So it, compared to real estate, where you can get leverage and you can get, you know, 10% annual return on the capital plus the income. It was a much safer option. You're basically taking, you're taking your money out of a high risk asset and putting it into a low risk asset. That's really what it was. You were in the generation where investing in the real estate was financially relatively affordable. Nowadays, you can't advise people in their 20s, 30s, hey, Take your money and invest in real estate because it's so expensive in London. How did that work at your time? So did you take all your profits as a dividend, as a salary, and then mm. to get the mortgage with the banks? And then how did that work? Yeah, the important part is the availability of capital. If you go back 20 years, you could get a buy-to-let mortgage and you could get 75% loan to value, 85% actually, sorry, 85% loan to wow. value. On buy to let? Yeah. And you could probably get it. I can't remember the percentages, but they're very low. And then what you could do is you could buy a distressed property. Let's say you buy a property for argument's sake, a hundred thousand pounds or euros or dollars, right? A hundred thousand. And it's run down. It's not in good situation. You could buy that. You could make a few changes to it. For example, like fix the kitchen which is, you know, maybe a few thousand pounds, but in massive uplift on the value, or maybe fix the, you know, paint the door outside so it doesn't look like a dump. You can make <laughs> a few changes and then within weeks, you could remortgage it. So you could buy it at 100,000, revalue it at 150,000 because the market was very bullish. Remortgage it for 85% of 150,000 keep the property, but extract all that extra cash out of the property. So a lot of people were doing that. A lot of people were buying, remortgaging, extracting the cash. Effectively, they're taking a loan. Hmm. So you could be taking 30,000 pound loan out of the business, out of the, the house for 3%. And it's all locked in the value of the house. So the credit, the availability back then was very different. You know, there wasn't really any, um, there wasn't Could so much in terms of... buy to let? Also, first for our audience, buy to let is a strategy where you would buy a house not to live in, but to rent it. So mm. that, that house is an asset. You would pay the mortgage and you would get cash flows from your tenants. And then you would calculate the profitability, which is the ratio of how much you get per year as a mortgage, minus, of course, all of your costs, including then the mortgage. And at the time, so you said you had 85% loan to value. It means mm. the bank would 
lend you 85% of the value of the house. That leaves you only 15% to fund. And that's called a leverage. That's a leverage of eight. Eight because you need to fund only one eighth of the price of the asset. The rest will be financed by the bank. They will bring you the capital. And leverage is how banks and most rich people make money. Because something that we don't often say is money brings money. Mm. If you can have the first initial deposit of a house, then you can use leverage, which means with just a 100K, I don't know how much you had from your business at the time, but from just 100K, you could buy 800K worth mm. house and asset. And that's, I guess, how you you build assets in the real estate bullish time. Mm. Yeah, because they were a lot more flexible then, a lot more less strict because we didn't have subprime market then. So they wanted to give you money. The banks wanted to lend you a lot of money. And therefore, they just wanted to make sure that you didn't put anything nasty on the application form because that's how they made their money. You know, the point about leverage for your listeners, Sam, is what people think about, let's say you buy a house for 100,000 and the house increases to 150,000 in value. People think that's a 50% increase in value. It's not because actually if you put in it's more your of a leverage, yeah, 15%, you put in 15,000 and now the difference is 65,000 between 150 and 85, you've effectively put in 15,000 and let's forget tax and fees and stuff like that. Your money has gone from 15,000 to 65,000, which is four times. And that's leverage. And it's, a dangerous game to play when the market's not going up. But that is how a lot of people made money out of real estate. And by the way, it sounds like, you know, because of us, we've priced people out of the market today, <laughs> right? Which is true. But, you know, that's the point is that we had to do, my generation did that because pensions were not an option. The generation before screwed that up. You know, we could not invest in pensions and get a return. There was no way that I could guarantee financial security. What you was know, wrong I, in the stock market and the pension funds at your time? Well, I think pension funds had a very bad outlook. You know, you had a problem where people weren't putting in as much as they were taking out. And you had situations where pension funds were raided, you know, and pension funds went bust. People did not trust pension funds. Is it the time where long-term capital bankrupted? Yeah, so long-term capital management, one of the biggest mm. bankruptcies. I can't remember the date, but it's around about then. So yeah, they had all of that. So nobody trusted it. And pensions are very inefficient as a savings investment model. There's a lot of costs, a lot of waste. They still are. Yeah. And you don't get choice, do you? When you get your pension, you can't do what you want with it. I don't know, obviously it's changed a lot in recent years, but back then when you got your pension, you had to take a lump sum and an annuity. And an annuity is like a interest payment on the pension. And the pension fund was relying on the fact that you would die not long after taking the annuity, <laughs> right? That's the model. It's serious. It's like they made their money because they knew statistically you would die within X number of years. So their business model was to take all your capital that you contribute on a yearly basis when you're an employee and then hope that you will die soon enough so that they won't need to pay you pensions for too long and therefore they would keep for themselves all the extra capital that you have invested throughout your life mm. but it won't be given to you. Was it their business model? I'm sure they won't say that. But that's kind of how it works, is that they rely on the fact. They, I mean, they have, you see pension funds spend a lot of money on actuaries. These people, actuaries are somebody who calculates your chance of dying, right? And that's how they make the money, like life yeah. funds. They have a lot of mortality tables. They know when you're going to die. And they're betting on the fact that they know it better than you. It's their entire job to know it better than us, by the way. 
Yeah, and they are actually statistically better than us because we yeah, tend are. to think That's we're going to live forever. Business. <laughs> yeah, it's like the casino house always wins. You know, it's a common theme that I have noticed. Whenever there's a company hiring quants, scientists, uh, using all the data against people, they always win. Yeah. Be yeah. it for betting, casino, insurance, banking, asset management, advertising, big tech companies, they always make the business model that when they win, it's often at the detriment of us people. Mm. Yeah, they know. And we people tend to think that we know better or we will live longer or we will make better decisions about day trading or a throw of a dice. You know, that's how people lose money yeah. because we get emotional of day about traders it. lose money. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've lost money on day trading because I was very bad at it. But I think the people who do make money, a very small percentage, they make a lot of money. Mm. Most people exactly. lose, right? Maybe like Clement Chiang. <laughs> yeah, those people it's who really probably part the of the 1%. Yeah, 1%. Everybody else is losing like, or making a little bit. Not enough to live on. But it's like gambling, isn't it? I mean, casinos make a lot of money from that hypothesis that spread the bet and the risk over many people, you'll win because you know the they numbers. Do. They do. So I think, you know, that's financial education. Sorry, it's a bit of a delay. Yeah, that's financial education, isn't it? Knowing that game and how it's rigged. Yep. The problem is financial education is not something that is taught either by companies, either by university, either by parents. It's kind of kept as a secret. And th that's my whole motivation for this podcast, for creating the money, for democratizing financial education. Because what I've realized is the main inequality and the main difference between those who are getting richer over time and making all the right financial decisions and the rest, the majority of people, it's financial education. Mm. Because financial education will drive all your decision making, will drive your habits, will drive your daily micro decisions that you think have no impact on the future. But when you compound them every single day, they make a massive difference. And that's, for example, what drove you to add your time to invest in real estate. And mm. obviously, you you made a very good move. Yeah, but you have to know that, right? You have to mm. be taught that. You have to learn it. Most people think that... You hear it. People say this stuff, Sam, right? You hear people say, oh, your house is your biggest investment. You hear that. It's absolute rubbish. Because the house you buy is not an investment. It's a liability. It doesn't sit on your balance sheet. It sits on the bank's balance sheet for a fact. And it's costing you, you money. Paid off. Yeah, right. 25 years later. That's the point, isn't it? And people don't know this. Like, what about credit cards? Wow. Why don't they teach that at school? How useful it would be to know how much money a credit card actually costs. What does 18% AER really mean? Yeah. <laughs> right? Why, or insurance on phones. So think about that. How much people will sell insurance on a phone for maybe $15 extra a month, $50 extra a month. But really, is that a good deal? People don't know. We're not educated about this at all. And you're absolutely right. They keep people dumb. Because if, if you're dumb, you, you'll happily give up your money. And if people are too educated, then you have to kill a lot of businesses. Right. Yeah. I mean, Especially in the financial services. Well, you know this area well. I mean, I've been in finance. I used to be a financial advisor. And it's just amazing how much people don't know. I've met doctors who... When I was young, I was a financial advisor, qualified FPC. And I met a doctor as a client and he was earning 200,000 pounds. Wow. And uh, 
he was about 250,000 pounds in debt. Debt, unsecured debt. I'm not talking house loan. Whoa. I'm, I'm talking credit cards, personal loans. 250,000. The man is earning 200K a year. I was and blown away. And he can't away. live with 200K. Amazing, huh? How is that possible? You know, it's the lifestyle. It's the lack of education. I mean, lack of education. And you would, think, you would think that a doctor is a relatively intelligent, reasonable, articulated, sensible person. I mean, he's the person that, that is checking your health. Yeah. If there is one person in the society that you need to trust on his judgment on being sensible, it's a doctor. Mm, they should know. But there you go. I saw Elon Musk tweeted today, don't confuse education and intelligence. And it's so true it's with true. finance, right? You don't need to be a doctor. You could be a taxi driver with all due respect to taxi drivers. You know, and you could make more money. And that's something people don't realize. It's not because you're intelligent that you're necessarily financially educated and that you have the wisdom and all the knowledge to make the right financial decisions and that you have the wisdom to have your emotions and your feelings aligned with mm. what you really want to achieve. Yeah. Not be swayed by other people. You know, that's important, isn't it? Think about, for example cars i know your generation younger people sam not so attached to cars hopefully that will help the planet but our generation terribly attached to cars we'll do bitcoin mining instead don't worry <laughs> pollution <laughs> level will remain constant <laughs> they'll find something else to ruin the planet but think about cars for example why do we buy a car most people buy a car to drive to work and they will spend statistically they will spend after tax income 60 to 70% of their annual salary on a car. Think about that. 60% of their after tax income. That means that they are working seven to eight months a year to pay for the car. Now, why do they need that car to drive to work? Why do they need to work to pay for the car? Like, how is that in any way sensible? that you now see people because of work from home. Maybe I don't need the car. If I don't need the car, I save all this money. If I save all this money, I don't need to work here. Maybe I can work in this job, which I enjoy. And maybe work less hard and less stressed. And maybe I don't need to live right in the center of town, save money on rent. So all these questions, what if questions people are asking about finances and it's unraveling. You know, now people are asking really big questions, not just about cars, but about careers, right? Because if I don't need that really expensive car, I don't need to be the managing director of this, you know, management consultancy to afford that lifestyle. So I think, you know, the tail wags the dog, as we say, right? That's the problem with finance. I think we're in a very interesting situation because the rules of the game are changing. Before, in my time, you wanted to have a job after graduation. You had to be in the city if you wanted to work like in the headquarter and for the important big companies. The rent was expensive. If you can go further, but you would spend one hour, if not more, commuting. And it was like a necessary evil to get the jobs and have the career perspective and get like some exciting roles maybe in five years. But now we live in a remote world. The whole planet has been working remotely for more than a year and it mostly worked. Like no drama, most companies can actually work remotely. Some people may like it, some people may dislike it. I have employees, they said, sorry, I don't like that. I prefer the human touch of being in mm. an office. Some other people like it. It's fine. It's a personal preference. But the fact is that nowadays, there are the opportunities for people to work remotely. There are companies who want to be remote. And there are people who want to be in the office, which is totally fine. But as you said, it completely changes the rules of the game. Think about your expenses. 
if mm. you're working remotely. You don't need to live in an expensive city place. You don't need to have a car or you can have like a smaller, cheaper car because you would just maybe drive for the weekend. And then factor that in into your income and expenses and what you will have left by the end of the month. I think a lot of people are really obsessed with what's their income, like the mm. gross income, which is really a bad indicator because you know the more you earn, the higher your tax rate. A doctor. And if you look at what's your post-tax and post-expenses income and what will be left for you as disposable to build your financial freedom to buy assets, to get buy to let property, to invest in the stocks, to diversify yourself, to buy bitcoins if you want to. And then you will see that there's a whole new range of opportunities now mm. in 2021. For sure. I was researching prior to this call and I saw there was a survey about millennials and money and something like 65% of millennials had said that their finances had improved in the last 18 months for all the reasons you say, which is great, really, because they're the ones who need it. And even now, there's talk that there's $4 trillion extra in the global economy. And then maybe not global economy, maybe it's the US. I'm not sure, because that's quite small, those numbers, $4 trillion. But let's say it's the US, $4 trillion extra floating around because of lockdown because of the last 18 months excess so yeah that's great i don't think people are going to rush out and spend that maybe they will on the first holiday but really some do i think it, it's a matter of mindset mm -hmm. there are people whenever they receive their income or any amount of money the only thing they have in mind is how to spend it and mostly because they were not presented with all their options. And when the only options that you have or you think you can do is spend on X, Y, or Z, then you will mm. only think of, how oh, great, I have more money. How can I spend more right away? And that's yeah. where financial education is really crucial because those who know that, okay, I can spend that. Do I really need it? Yes, no, I can think of it. But what are all the other things that I can do? I can buy property, I can invest, etc. I can save, I can do this. I can do refurbishment for my house, which will increase its price and value. You have choice. We have That's choices. It. I feel that what the most valuable aspect of financial education is knowing that what average people say, all those people you talk about, all the ones who are worried about their salary income, as opposed to, you know, the remainder at the end of the month, all the ones that are worried about looking good, keeping up, having a nice car so they can impress the co-workers, all those people have an opinion about money and how we should use it. And the great thing about financial, real financial education is understanding, actually, there's an alternative and there are people out there like yourself, educators, and there are great books out there as well that people can read. And there's a movement, isn't there, of people who are now questioning fire. all of it. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. People, you've I love got to question fire movement. it. Yeah, I think it's great that it's got momentum. You know, people are saying, why? Why do we do things like this? This doesn't make sense. Yeah, so our generation can't invest in real estate easily. It's, it's possible, of course, but it's super hard. Mm -hmm. Nothing comparable to your case. And a lot of people have this financial objective. They want to live in their house. And when you try to do that in an expensive city in 2021 with the current salaries, well, it looks depressing. So it's very easy to fall into, oh, my only options are spending on a car or spending on a clothes or spending on Z and none of that are assets and none of that will make me money and none of mm. that will increase and build my financial freedom. But you were lucky at the time because you actually made a very smart decision to do buy to let. Most people, their main objective is to buy a house for themselves. How did you know that it was a good decision to do buy to let? Who taught you that or how did you learn it? There were a lot of people who were out there talking about 
building assets. Of course, you read books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which everybody of my generation read. I still recommend it to everybody. Still think it's a great tale about how... It's to... a classic, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so good. You know, maybe it's a little bit dated, but it's completely true. There's the truth there. And then you have people, there have been people who have commentated on financial independence. I followed people like Jim Rogers, who is based out here in Singapore, um, used to work with George Soros in the fund. And what they talk about where, for example, like how you should invest, where you should be investing in, etc. People like Peter Schiff it is a little bit extreme, but, you know, again, he's all about taking control of your life through your money, if you like, you know, and there's many ways of doing it. So I think there were a lot of people out there talking about this. And, you know, in my generation, a lot of people doing real estate investing, sharing pre-social media, bulletin boards, <laughs> these kind of things, like meetups. So there was a lot of education out there if you wanted so was it. was the way? Meetups, talking to people who were in the field and interested into investing. Yeah. And being a mentoring with somebody, right? Even if they didn't consider them a formal mentor, just to be around them. You know, I would go to auctions. I would turn up to auctions. I didn't have anything to invest back then, like early, early 2000s. And I would go to an auction just to absorb it, like property auction. And then I would go and look at a property that, you know, they would advertise all the properties for sale and you would go you drive to somewhere in the country and see this farmhouse which is completely collapsed and you could walk around and look at it and then you'd meet a builder and the builder would say oh yeah we've got to put in the a new eaves here and the new roof and you you just get out there you've got to like a big part of education is just talking to a lot of people putting yourself out there and learning and, and being curious And that's what I did. I went to property auctions. I went to events. I did training courses. I went and visited properties. You know, I made friends with property investors and went and saw their properties. Just became really obsessed about just trying to learn as much as possible. Reading, viewing, seeing, talking, doing. And I think this is a big part of education. It's just being really curious because nobody's going to teach you. There's no, no lesson at school about this. You have to take control of your own financial education yourself. And when we say investing in financial education, it doesn't mean paying fancy degrees at universities. It means investing your time and your effort and your energy. Because sometimes what you need to learn the most about your market and what you want to invest in is exactly like you did. You go there, go to the field, try to understand what's the value of a house. How do people price that? What's the process? How does the builder think of the cost of refurbishment? And when you speak to them, then you will learn a lot from their experience. Yeah, that's such an important way of doing it. And that then gives you the edge. And you can go into property investment and not make any money. You've got to have something that the next guy doesn't have. It's like investing. You've got to understand... Like, what am I investing in? What am I good at? What should I focus on? And you have to have something that you're bringing, right? It's the same. We talked about like with startup investments, you know, off air, like how important. If you're investing in startups, you can lose a lot of money. You have to know what you're doing. You have to talk to people, get really um, educated about this. And then you've got to have your edge. What is it that I bring here that allows me to make money? Because if everybody can do this, then... You know, there's no barriers It's to entry. Crowded. Hmm. It doesn't sound that glamorous to go into the farm in the countryside to look for a house, the auction, etc. What made you decide doing that instead of, for example, just going out for dinner or a restaurant with your friends? Uh, that's a really good question. <laughs> Because a lot of people did do that. A lot of people did go out and dinner a restaurant with their friends. You know, I was obsessed about education, learning. I knew that this would be a way of setting myself up later in life. And I wanted to know, like I wanted control over my own financial situation because then it has choice, right? I can do these things. I, you know, we traveled the world for four years out of three suitcases because of this, right? Wow. So yeah, that. 
Et Your passive payant. income was enough to finance your lifestyle traveling across the world for four years. More or less. Yeah. If you dialed it back and you didn't live in expensive places, you could do that. So yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's choice. Because I could have done like what you suggested, go out for drinks and dinners with my friends and that all would have gone, right? Never had the choice. But that's what you you know, it's an off, it's a long-term investment, right? In that. Yeah. It's a mindset. You invest in your future. Absolutely. And I think that is probably, it's timelines, isn't it? If you want things now, you want it, want it now, got to get quick returns, you'll never make any money. But if you can invest, like consider, for example, Jeff Bezos and Amazon, that whether or not you revere him as a business figure, he has one, been one of the most successful entrepreneurs of our generation. And he invested in very long timelines. He even had a 10,000 year clock which would go around the clock in 10,000 years, right? And that's him. That's how he thinks. He thinks like very long timelines. He could invest yeah. like 10 years, 12 years out. Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, they were all investing in their business for the long term. I think the danger is now there are a lot of examples, Wall Street bad social media of people who got lucky. and. Mm. They got rich overnight. Oh, look, I, I've bought X amount of options on GME and I had a low leverage of 1,000 and now I'm rich. And this extreme minority who are boosting their extraordinary profits, the 99.9% of the people believe that's how you build wealth and that's how you build freedom. Whereas, no, it's just that Out of the distribution, if there is 1 million people doing mm. different random risky strategies, of course, there will be 0.001 who have winning strategies with out of the ordinary returns. These are called outliers. Mm. But this is not a strategy to count to be lucky. Yeah, but it's difficult when you're, you have a fear of missing out, right? And you see yes. all these, you go onto Instagram and they're there. You know, the people living the lifestyle. Oh, I woke up this morning and I made 100,000, like by the pool. And it makes you look at yourself and think, well, look at me, I'm, I'm poor. I'm living this crap lifestyle and working really hard. And look at these guys, how are they doing it? And then you question all your, you know, your base reasoning about hard work and about investment and about long term. You question all of that. And then you crumble and then you say oh i'll sign up for one of these courses or i'll you know i'll give Get them my money weekly scam that's what happens right yeah fomo so it took you what 15 years to build financial freedom between getting all the money from your businesses reinvesting building assets how many houses and properties did you buy on the buy to let Over time, about about eight, eight. Okay. and then yeah, one of them was like well, actually two of them were multiple occupation, meaning they're like a large, for example, like these large Victorian houses, which would have six rooms in them, and you convert them into individual units. So those were quite profitable. And how long did it take you to buy those eight properties? Seven years. Okay. So at so the beginning, I went in quite nothing hard. Nothing overnight. No, no, I went in, like at the beginning. I, I remember in the first three years, I probably bought five. Yeah, and then uh, just slowed down a little bit after that, because there's a point once you buy up to a point, either you turn this into a business, or you just level out. Well, well done. What would be your word of advice to all people listening to us and? who also want to build financial freedom. And they all see the excitement on social media of everybody who seemed to be getting rich overnight. That's tough. Luckily, when I was doing it, there wasn't Instagram <laughs> or TikTok, right? So I don't know Do you think that's working against people now? It makes it harder, you know. But like if you're tuning in to the right people, like listening to Sam, for example... 
then you're turning into the right people. Turn into the right people, hang around with the right people, um, understand that what appears to be financial freedom and financial success in social media quite often isn't. You know, it's like hip hop videos. Like most of the cars are rented. They don't own that helicopter. <laughs> so it, that's the world that we portray. And it's really being centered in yourself and understanding that whatever people say, real wealth creation is hard. Real wealth creation takes time and takes education. And you can't do it overnight unless you're very lucky, but you're more likely to be struck by lightning. And if you don't want to play the odds, then you can build financial independence if you do it organically over time, set yourself time, learn and do it the right way. And you will get there. It may take years, but you'll get there. You'll use those years anyway. You'll get old anyway, right? So you might as well do it, putting money aside and investing it, not gambling. And a big part of that is when you look at those pictures, yes, you'll be seduced. Yes, you'll be infiltrated in your mind and your consciousness, doubting yourself. But you have to remember that you know, it's not what it seems. Excellent advice. Graham, where people can learn more about you? My website, grahamdbrown.com, has my works and my stories on there. Welcome anybody to reach out to me through that website. Awesome. Graham, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your story, and telling people how it actually works in reality to build financial freedom. I think we have too many examples of get rich overnight and not enough examples of people who actually are working on building their financial freedom. So thank, thank you, you so Sam. much. Yeah. Love what you're doing. So important. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this episode enjoyable, inspiring, and educational. In this era of instant gratification, it is more important than ever to train our delayed gratification muscle. So keep learning, keep improving by 1% every day. You may not see the results right now, but this is a secret of all the successful people I've met. Please help me spread financial education by sharing this podcast with your friends and community. I would love it if you could also leave us a review. It really helps the show. Now, I would like you to forget about all the advertising that is being pushed to us on a daily basis and think about your personal financial goals. What do you really want to achieve with your money? If you have financial objectives, then check out the Nova Money app. Nova is an AI that will show you how to set financial goals and how to achieve them. A plan is only useful if you can follow it. That's why Nova will send you daily motivational messages to give you the strength to ignore the daily temptations of spending money and stay focused on your goals. Like other budgeting apps, Nova connects all your bank accounts in one place to give you the full picture. The difference is that the Nova AI will do all the budgeting and tracking for you. The second difference is that unlike many free personal finance apps, we don't sell users data. All your data is encrypted and will remain completely private. Make sure that you're investing in your financial education. Make sure that you're building your financial freedom. And I'll speak to you in the next episode.